Before we return to the Word of God today, let us pray that God might speak to us during this time as well. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to listen to your Word this morning, we ask that you would speak. That by your Spirit, you would open us up to the truth of your grace, to the truth of your Son, that we might come to know you more fully and understand again in new ways the forgiveness that you, are, you have offered us. Father, we ask that you would speak, for we, your children, are ready to listen. Amen. About ten minutes ago, I realized I left a book in my office I was going to use as my prop. So pretend I'm holding a book, because I didn't have any time to get back to my office since then. Um, my, the book I'm holding up, I actually have two books. One my dad stole, so I can't hold it up. What's So Amazing About Grace by Philip Yancey. It's my favorite book of all time, and I loaned it to him, and now I can't find it back. I think he has it. The other book I was going to hold up that I do have with me is Vanishing Grace. Whatever Happened to... Or, yeah, Vanishing Grace, Whatever Happened to the Good News, also by Philip Yancey. Two of my favorite books, because if there's one of the things that I can struggle with, that I think a lot of us struggle with, it's trusting in the grace or forgiveness of God. We struggle with it. Kids don't seem to struggle with this in the same way that adults do. They may struggle to forgive sometimes. There are times as a parent you make your kid say they're going to forgive someone and they do it with that tone of voice that implies they don't really forgive them yet. But we make them anyway and they go through the motions and they try. Forgiving people is hard. But kids don't seem to struggle with accepting forgiveness. They're really good at receiving grace from other people. One of my favorite moments as a parent happens after my least favorite moment. So my least favorite moment is when one of my kids does something that violates kind of the rules and expectations in our house and they have to be disciplined. I hate disciplining kids. It's not fun. They get mad at you. I want my kids to like me. But even more than that, I want my kids to be grown-ups someday. So we discipline them and it's hard and it breaks your heart when you see them feel so bad. And then sometimes they actually feel bad they did something wrong. That's one of the best moments as a parent when your kid genuinely repents, right? Like that's just amazing. And then you get to say things. This becomes my favorite part. You get to say, it's okay, I forgive you. You're loved. No matter what you do, you'll always be my kid. I will always love you with this love that can't be broken no matter what you do because you're mine. I love that. And when some, a couple of my kids were little, they were these, like, the, they, they lived life with capital letter emotions. And so when you forgave them, they didn't say, okay, good. They, like, hugged you, but they didn't hug you like we hug. We hug carefully and gently. They hug with their arms and their legs get wrapped around you and their head, like, curls around you somehow. Their whole body, like, just gloms on because you forgave them. It's the best feeling ever. And then this is what always amazes me. They hug you, they get down, and they go play like nothing big just happened. That's no big deal because they know they're forgiven and they move on. They don't spend the rest of the day trying to make it up to me. They don't spend any time feeling bad they did something because I forgave them. They moved on. That's how life works. And they're gone. And they're having fun again. It's amazing, isn't it? At its core, that's what forgiveness is about, right? You just, it's just taking away the guilt and the shame. And you get what you need rather than what you deserve. Kids get that and they accept that. Adults don't get that kind of grace so well, do we? I'm not completely sure why it is we struggle with it. Maybe, maybe it's because we struggle to forgive. Maybe we struggle to accept forgiveness because we struggle to forgive others. Have you ever had the experience where you thought you forgave someone? Maybe it was a sibling. And they did something a long time ago and you're mad and then you forgave them. And then you were at a family gathering. And you thought you had forgiven them. And then, and then they did that other thing. And we don't want to talk about it. Don't want to raise anxiety, but you know what we're talking about. Some of you are nudging your siblings right now right? And all of a sudden, you're mad about that thing they just did and all of your frustration from when you were six and they got what you wanted and it all comes up and you thought you'd forgiven them and then you realize, oh no, I'm still this bitter, angry little kid who gets mad at my sibling for stuff because it's hard to forgive, isn't it? 
We can, we can decide to forgive. We can intend to forgive. We can try to forgive and discover years later, oh no, we have to do it all over again, don't we? For the same thing. Because forgiveness is hard work. I think maybe that's partly why we struggle to, forg- what we struggle to accept forgiveness. But I think it's not just that we know that true forgiveness is hard and don't trust it, but I think a part of us doesn't really want to be forgiven. There's a part of us that doesn't want to be forgiven because if someone just forgives you, although what it means is they've let you off the hook for what you did wrong, what we feel is, well, now I am still indebted to them because they're so gracious, they forgave me, and how do I ever make up the, for what I did? And, I, and we still feel indebted, and now we feel guilty that they're so much better than us because they just forgave us. Because forgiveness at its or really does put you indebted to someone else. If you have a debt and you owe someone and they forgive you, you don't technically owe the debt, but you still sense that, wow, they did something huge for you right now, and some of us wants to pay it back, don't we? We want to pay it back somehow. We want to stand on our own two feet. We want to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. That's the American way, right? We're self-reliant people. If we're honest, we want God's grace and our works to work together to put us in the right before God. Wouldn't it be great if God forgave us and then our works counted so we got credit for how good we were too? If that was enough? If we're honest, many of us, that's a part of what we want. Because then we can feel good about who we are because, well, I'm here because I'm so good. Because I do all these, God forgave me, but look at all these other good things I did, unlike those other people. But if it's all about grace and forgiveness, we can't do that anymore. Kids don't have that burden. They can have a knockdown, drag out fight with a friend, and five minutes later, they'll be laughing together. Adults, if we have knockdown, drag out fights, like five years later, we're still nursing that old grudge, if we're honest, aren't we? But kids can just move on. Now, maybe boys do this better than girls. I recognize that some there's gender differences, but it's still true. They can kids move on faster than us grown-ups do. Kids have short memories because there just wasn't that much to remember yet, I think. They only had a couple years. And I think kids can move on because kids are used to owing people things and not being able to pay them back. Think about what it's like to be a kid for a moment. You don't have any money. You don't have a job. You're not particularly strong compared to the adults around you. You don't have any real influence. You don't know that much yet. And someone else makes all your meals for you. Someone else pays for the house that you live in. Someone else buys you clothes, and then they clean said house, they clean said clothes, and they wash said dishes when you're done eating the food that they made for you. And you can't do any of that yet when you're really little. Little kids are the best grace receivers in the world because all of their life is about receiving things they don't deserve and can't earn. They have a lot of practice. Adults, not so much. We often think that grace makes us weak and powerless, indebted, and so we struggle to accept forgiveness from other people And if we're honest, we can struggle to accept it from God. In Western traditions, we like to define things while using definitions. And so we have dictionaries, and that's how you figure out what a word means. But in Jewish tradition, if someone asks you to define something, rather than pointing you to a dictionary, they might say something like, well, let me tell you a story. And then the story will explain what that word means. And you'll have to reflect on, well, how does that word fit into the story? And and it gives you something to kind of mull over the rest of the day. So today I want to give you two stories you can mull over. The first one is about the type of forgiveness Jesus offers. The second is about how people respond to that forgiveness. The first story is not in the Bible anywhere. The second story is in Luke chapter 7. So the first story does not happen in the Bible. It doesn't happen in the ancient world unless you're really young. Then it happens about in the late 1980s in Hawaii. So that's ancient for some of you. So imagine yourself in Hawaii in the 80s. This is a story uh, that Tony Campolo tells. 
it's his story, and he's, he's the main character. So Tony is in Hawaii for a conference or something, and he can't sleep, and he ends up wandering down the streets of Honolulu at 3 a.m. Nothing's open at 3 a.m. in any town except really gross, greasy spoon dive of a diner's. Every town needs a greasy spoon dive of a diner if anything's going to be open after three. And Honolulu has one. So he wanders in, and he goes and he sits down. And have you ever been in one of those dive greasy spoon diners that when you sit down and you move on the vinyl seat, you realize that your pants stick? <laughs> You've been there, right? And you put your arms on the counter, and then you realize you shouldn't do that because it sticks there too. So he sits down at the diner and the seat's sticky and the counter's sticky and he's looking at the menu and the menu's dirty and the guy behind the counter waiting on has this apron and it's all greasy on it and he's doing one of these numbers. <laughs> doing one of those numbers and he's trying to decide, what do I order at 3 a.m. at a greasy spoon when I can't sleep? Oddly enough, he thinks, I'll order coffee. So he orders coffee and a donut because no one would have to touch the donut. Little did he know, the guy pours the coffee, says, I'll get your donut with his hand on his greasy apron, and he picks the donut up with his bare hand. Greasy, gross, just wipe my nose, bare hand, and gives it to Tony. And there's Tony, three of drinking his coffee, eating his dirty, greasy, slimy, gross donut. Don't you love this story? This is a great story. And then three women walk in, women who work the streets at night in Honolulu. And they sit down at, at the diner, at, right next to Tony at the bar. And one of them says to the girl next to her, tomorrow is my 39th birthday. And her friend goes, what do you want? You want us to sing a happy birthday and throw you a party? I ain't doing that. And the woman says, no, I don't want anything. I just wanted you to know I'm turning 39 tomorrow. I've never had a birthday party or cake. I don't need any of that. I just wanted someone to know. And they, they finish whatever they were eating, they leave, and, and Tony leans in and he, t and he says to the guy behind the counter, so do those women come here often? He goes, yeah, they come every night, right around this time. Tony says, I got an idea. What if we throw her a birthday party tomorrow? Here, at 3 a.m. when she shows up. And the guy looks at him like, you're the weirdest guy I've ever seen. And he thinks about it and goes, hey, honey. And his wife comes out. She's the short order cook in the back. He says, hey, this guy wants to throw Agnes a birthday party. And the wife goes, Agnes, oh, she's one of the good people. She's one of the kind people. And the guy behind the counter says, I'll bake the cake. Just what Tony wanted, eat that guy's food. But he makes the cake, and Tony says, I'll get the decorations and the hats and the candles. And they agree that's what they're going to do. So the next night, Tony comes in around 1, and they start decorating the diner. By 3 o'clock, apparently, the guy behind the counter had told all of the other women in the line of work that Agnes is in about the party, and they all show up a little before 3. And so, as Tony says, it's him in the diner with the guy behind the counter, and it's wall-to-wall -wall prostitutes all through in the diner. And Agnes comes in with her two other friends. And she sees all the streamers and she sees the hats and, and they sing happy birthday and they light the candles and she's supposed to blow the candles out but she's so overwhelmed by it that she can't actually take a breath because she's in one of those like sobbing, <laughs> not able to really breathe as she's fighting back all the tears and so someone else blows the candles out for her. And then they give her a knife and say, Agnes, you cut the cake. And she looks at the cake and she looks at the knife and she looks at the cake and then the knife. And, and she sets the knife down and says, can, can, I, can I show my mom the cake first? And Tony says, it's your cake. Do with it what you want. She goes, she lives two doors down. I'll be back. And she picks up the cake and she walks out and she leaves <laughs> with the cake in the middle of her party. And so it's Tony and the guy behind the counter and his wife and all the prostitutes in the room and it's kind of quiet. It's a little awkward. What do you do when the guest of honor leaves the party and you don't know anyone? So Tony does what any good sociologist who works as a preacher half the time does. He says, let's pray. So they pray. And he prays for Agnes that God would bless her, that God would heal her from all the things that men have done to her and all the ways that she's been wounded, that he would give her joy and abundant life. And he just prays for Agnes. And he says, amen. And, and the guy behind the counter looks at him, goes, you said you were a sociologist. You're not a sociologist. You're one of those preachers. What kind of church do you go to anyway? 
Tony says, I go to the kind of church, and this is a quote, so let me apologize ahead of a time for the quote. Please do not get mad at me. Tony Campolo is a nationally known speaker. He says this, so I'm going to say it. This is his quote. This is what he said to the man. I go to the kind of church where people throw parties at 3 a.m. for whores because God loves them. And the man says, there ain't no church like that. I'd go to a church like that. If you wonder how that fits in with Jesus, listen to what people said about Jesus in Luke chapter 7, verse 34. This was the complaint of the religious folk about Jesus. Jesus is quoting them. He says, The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. The religious people, people who would go to church every single week and sit in the pews and give their money and sing their songs and read their scripture and say their prayers, got mad at Jesus because he spent his time hanging out with the tax collectors and the sinners and the prostitutes and the rejects and the outcasts that no religious person would go near. And then he threw them parties. That's why he's a drunkard. He's always at the parties with all the sinners. What if God's forgiveness is really like that? What if God's forgiveness is really about loving people who are far from God so much that you throw them parties, no strings attached, just because God loves them and you want them to know? What if that's what the grace of God looks like? What if God is the kind of God who meets us in the midst of our messes that we make, in our midst of our brokenness, and he loves us and throws us parties? How would we respond if we really believed that's who God was? Which leads to my second story. It takes place right after Luke 7, verse 34. It begins at Luke 7, verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating the, at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet... He would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. We'll get to the woman first, or in a minute, but first I want you to notice the Pharisee. The Pharisee invites Jesus over to dinner so that he can feed him, so that Jesus in essence owes him a meal now, right? Because that's how it works. You feed someone, they have to invite you over later. Because there's something in the Pharisee that can't imagine that he needs anything from Jesus. Even in this conversation, it's clear the Pharisee is looking at Jesus, deciding, is Jesus good enough for me? Is he a good enough prophet for me to listen to? Is he a good enough teacher for me to follow or not? He's in the business of evaluating and judging if Jesus is as good as he is. That's the approach, that's the attitude he has toward Jesus. We learn later in the text, and we'll get to it, that the man never even properly welcomes Jesus into his home. He's so sure of his worth and value that he won't stoop to welcome his guest into his house, as if somehow Jesus is, owes him because he invited him over. And now that this woman is here, and it's not unusual for the poor and the rejects to gather in a house, they didn't have the same sense of privacy we do, so there were probably lots of people uninvited who gathered around the table and figured they'd get the leftovers. That's how poor often survived in those days. He sees the woman there weeping at Jesus' feet, washing his feet, and all he can think is that she needs justice. She needs to get how bad she is. She needs to be rejected for her sin, cast out and humiliated in front of everyone, and then Jesus is the kind of person I'd want to follow. I think he wants these things because he is so confident of his goodness, he can't imagine he would ever need to be forgiven. I think it's easy for us in the church to fall into that same trap to begin to think that we've somehow done all of these good things. Like we gave money to Good News to Paul and someone heard about the gospel. Clearly God must love us, right? 
we're the good people. And we have our list of all the things that we've done that somehow make us worthwhile. I teach Sunday school. I go on youth trips. And I, I, I donated pancakes yesterday. I paid way more than those pancakes were worth. Right? We're so good. And we can think about all the things we've done as if now because we've done some good things that God owes us. Now God owes us a good life, a spiritual experience that we might experience God in some deep, profound way. Or that God owes us that we should be healthier, that our family would be healthier, that we get the job we want. That somehow because we've done some good things, God owes us. And that's this man. He thinks God owes him. He sits in the presence of Jesus. He hears Jesus' teaching. He probably even sees some miracles because Jesus is always doing miracles. But he never receives forgiveness because he can't imagine he would need it. He's so confident in his rightness before God. And then there's the woman. Everyone knows she needs forgiveness. Luke seems to be playing it nice with his words. She's a known sinner. A woman with apparently no husband, mingling with the men at night, wearing her expensive perfume... Let's just say she would have fit in at Agnes' birthday party just fine. But she too has seen Jesus. And she's listened to his teaching and she knows that Jesus loves people like her. The word is out. Jesus hangs out with tax collectors and sinners. And he offers them forgiveness. He, he welcomes them because forgiveness isn't just what having sins forgiven for them and for us. It's about being included in God's family. Your sins separate you from God, but forgiven. You, you're part of God's family. You're one of his kids. She's part of the people of God if she's forgiven. And she realizes what Jesus offers her and she weeps. She's so overwhelmed by that forgiveness that the tears just fall and Jesus' feet get wet and she doesn't have anything to dry them with, so she kneels down and she undoes her hair. The kind of thing a woman should only do with her husband in those days in private. She does in public to Jesus. She undoes her hair and she starts wiping his feet with her hair and she pours perfume on his feet. Tears not of anguish but of repentance and joy because she's been forgiven. And then Jesus tells a story. Jesus answered the Pharisee. He says, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You've judged correctly. Jesus said. This woman experiences that love and forgiveness of God. She gets how big her sin was. And she moves in really what can only be described as an obscene display of gratitude. Because that's what forgiveness does. It makes us act in over-the-top ways to show our gratitude to God. Because forgiveness always requires something of the forgiver. If you forgive a betrayal, you forgo the justice that you deserve. If you forgive someone's gossip, you forgo your honor. You set it aside and you live with the shame of the lie that they've told. Forgiveness always takes the suffering that the sinner has caused and puts it on the forgiver rather than on the sinner. That's how forgiveness works. The one who forgives takes the pain and refuses to push it on the one who sinned. When you recognize what Jesus endured for you and is setting aside the glory of heaven to come and be a baby, in the nights he spent sleeping outside, in his hunger and tiredness, in his betrayal by his friends, in his own people calling for his death and ultimately actually suffering and dying on the cross, the only proper response we can have is one of profound, overwhelming, obscene gratitude for what Christ has done for us. That gratitude turns into a life of service, of not earning God's favor, but living out of God's favor. It's one of the reasons that I love the Reformed tradition. So this is what I love about the Reformed tradition. Now you get to your theology of the day. So remember your theology of the day. Reformed tradition, one of our main theological statements is the Heidelberg Catechism, 123 questions, um, 52 Lord's Days, so up in 52 weeks. It has three sections to it. The first section is sin. It's not very long. The second is 
is salvation. It too is not very long. The vast majority is called service. It's also labeled as guilt, grace, and gratitude. What's fascinating is that for most people and in most traditions, the law of God gets put under sin because that's how we know that we've sinned. Because the law is used to beat us up for being failures, for being screw-ups, for being mess-ups. But that's not all the catechism uses the law. It's not over there. It's in the gratitude part. The law is there because if you recognize what God has done for you, the proper response is gratitude to want to please God, to thank Him, not to earn it, but just to thank Him for that gift. And He's told us what pleases Him. Obey the law. So the law is in gratitude, not to judge us, not to condemn us, but so we know how to thank God well. We should be obscene followers of the law. We should be obscene in our longing to care for the poor, to feed the hungry, to house the homeless, to clothe the naked, to get clean water, those who have dirty water. We should be obscene in the ways that we work to bring God's peace and justice in our world, in sharing the gospel with others, risking their rejection, and all that comes with it, because look what Jesus did. We should be obscene in our response, in our gratitude, in our obedience. Ultimately, for this woman, she's obscene as she pours all of perfume and all of that. But there's also a change of direction that we might miss just reading through the story quickly. So let's finish the story out at verse 44. Then Jesus turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love is shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, I couldn't find multiple references to this historical observation, so I only found one this week. I spent a couple hours, and I finally gave up. So I found one place that this is referenced. But according to at least one person, in that day, prostitutes would often wear perfume around their neck as a symbol of what they did for a living, because it's kind of a smelly job. And they would wear the perfume so people knew who they were. So this woman has this job, and she comes to Jesus. And other Gospels tell us that this perfume was worth a year's wages. And she pours that perfume out on Jesus' feet. And we think of the wealth and the expense of that. But think about what it means if she breaks the one thing that tells people who she is and what she does. A year's wages were gone in that symbol. She's not going to buy another one. This is a woman who receives forgiveness and repents. She's making a major life change, isn't she? She's not going back to the way she was. She's going to live differently because she's experienced the forgiveness of Jesus. And once again, we notice the order of things. She doesn't first change her life and then get forgiven. She gets forgiven and it leads to changing her life. Just like Zacchaeus, we talked about last week. It always starts with God's grace and moves to our gratitude. And it leads to a change in her life. So let me ask you today, as you think about this story, who do you identify with? Who do you identify with in this story? Pastors often identify with Jesus when we read Scripture. You can go into all of the psychological issues that should trouble you and us pastors, that we read Scripture and think, oh, Jesus, I'm just like him. That's a little troubling for all of us. Maybe you sometimes fall into that, true, so, that trap too. So you're not Jesus in this story. None of us are. So who do you identify with in the story? Maybe you identify with the woman, or with the crowd, excuse me. Maybe you're, you're hearing about Jesus and you're thinking about who he is and what it means and you don't know what to make of Jesus. The stories you read of Jesus, they're compelling and you're drawn to them. But he says things that you know... The Bible says only God could say. I mean, who can really forgive sins other than God? But Jesus does. So either Jesus is who he seems to say he is, or he's like a pastor in need of a lot of counseling because he has a God complex, one or the other, right? 
He can't just be a good teacher because good teachers don't claim they're God. So either he is God or he's not a good teacher. So you have to pick and, and you're not sure and you just want to know more. Maybe you're the crowd and you're listening and trying to figure out who Jesus is. Or maybe you're, you, you identify with a woman. Maybe you know what it is to have made mistakes. Maybe you know what it's like to have been rejected even by the good religious folk in the church. You know what it is to feel like you're on the outside and God couldn't love someone like you. And maybe today you wonder if the forgiveness of Jesus is for you too. Or maybe you're a step beyond that and you know what that was like and you've recognized that forgiveness was for you and it's completely transformed your life. Maybe you're the woman and you can't wait to show your gratitude in obscene ways to God because you love him so much. But I'll be, honest, I'll be honest with you today. When I read the story this week, I want to identify with a woman. Like, that's where you want to end up, right? That's the good place to be. But if I'm honest, when I read the story and I reflected on it throughout the week, I can probably more easily identify with a Pharisee. Maybe you can too. You know, he's the religious guy. He's followed all the rules. He knows all the right answers. He knows how things are supposed to be done. They're trying hard. They're doing their best. And it's easy to start thinking that that makes us somehow better or more worthy of God's grace and forgiveness than someone else might be. Because look at all the stuff we're trying to do. Look at all the ways we're trying to obey. But the reality is the Pharisee and me and you, we're no different than the woman. We just might be in denial. I've sinned and you've sinned. We've all wandered from God. We've all messed up. We all need forgiveness. So maybe today you catch yourself standing with a Pharisee and it's a chance to say, no, I've got to move to a new spot. It's not really who I am. Today, maybe we should just praise God. We should praise God during this Advent season that we serve a God who forgives the humble sinners and the arrogant, self-righteous religious people too. And maybe like a child, we can trust that forgiveness this year, that we are loved, that we are forgiven, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done. We are the children of God. Believe this gospel and live in its peace. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the gift you've given us in your Son, for the forgiveness that he offers to us, and we ask by your grace that you would help us to receive it, to accept it, to stop trying to earn it, and simply be grateful, and to show our gratitude to you and the world for the amazing gift we found in your Son. We pray this in his name. Amen.